Hey everybody, welcome to what I am calling conversations with our contributors. So we have our Climb Issue of Moments magazine coming out on November the 10th. And today I have the beautiful, amazing privilege to talk to Michelle Hasayek Nassif again. Um, we have all sorts of bumping in points <laughs> where we are working on uh, programs together and collaborating on a bunch of different things. And I am so thrilled that you are here to talk about the article that you're writing for the Moments Magazine coming up because it is a little out of the box. And, uh, and thank you so much for being here to talk about it. We, we're gonna dive in a little bit today. We're not gonna give everybody everything about the article, but welcome here today. Thank you so much, Lisa. And yeah, it's always a pleasure to work with you. And what we've achieved this year really inspires a lot of my work. So I'm really excited to just dig into the, the subject with you. Awesome. And so for those of you that have been um, spending any time on any one of our Moments Magazine um, articles or any of the issues, we have departments. So I call them departments. So we've got purpose and plan, we've got sound and light, and we've got food and drink. And one of the departments that we always bring to every issue of Moments is called space and time. And traditionally, how we've talked about space and time is about your loading dock schedule, <laughs> or we've talked about um, time management, or we have talked about venue spaces. How do you choose a venue space? But what we're doing in this 10th and final issue of Moments is really going deeper. And Michelle, you are the perfect, perfect person to be taking us a little bit deeper on what does it actually mean to set our timeline for the day. So we're going to be talking today a little bit about giving a bit of a teaser for your article in our space and time section, but we're going to be talking about what does it actually mean to start to create rituals in our lives. And when we think of rituals, sometimes we'll think um, rigidity, or we might think, oh, then, you know, that's too, um, you know, my life is all over the place. And especially for many of us that have gone through COVID and we're working from home and we're trying to plan events the best we can. And we've got all juggling all the balls in the air, what the value of ritual is in our lives, but what does that actually mean for planners? And I know you have planned a ton of events, Michelle, you are a community builder um, and you are a feminine leader and you are encouraging feminine leaders to embody um, really what their best lives are. And maybe we should start there. You're going to be talking a little bit of, about rituals in this article. What does that mean for you? What does that actually, um, when you decided to use that word, what does that mean for you? Yeah, absolutely. And so in the business world, um, there's, there has historically been, and there still are a lot of um, specific terms and references for, you know, what we would call habits or steps or tools or tips on how to elevate our leadership and to increase our productivity. And, and there's nothing wrong with some of the reference points and those in that language that we that we use. Um, but what I'm asking readers of Moments Magazine to, to consider and to challenge is how that's actually working for them in their daily lives and how a simple mind shift could potentially enhance their productivity and their overall mindset and feelings of well-being in business. And so when I talk about embodiment practices and how we, we can turn those autopilot habits into daily rituals, what that means is that all we're doing is we're just reframing what we do every single day into a more holistic context and integrating some very simple practices that help us to stay present in our bodies and present in every moment so that we can cultivate a stronger awareness of our heart and our mind that will help to boost and amplify and enhance our decision-making abilities. Because all business leaders, regardless of what industry you're in, whether you're planning events or whether you're managing a team or running a company, decisions are a huge part of your day. And a lot of people suffer from decision fatigue. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of this article is to provide a new perspective 
that is meant to align your heart and your mind so that you can make decisions and execute business from a more heart-centered space and, and to be able to activate that internal compass that we all possess so that we can optimize our days and, and all of the goals and objectives that we need to face every single day. And when you talk about practice, um, the beauty of, of building a practice whether that is as a business or as somebody that's building a career, a lot of event planners that will be reading this will be um, having practices in their lives of certain things. I think if we start looking at it that way, it, it isn't necessarily about getting to one result. So when we're talking about an event, there's, there's a date and there's a timeline. And, and when we're talking about building a practice, what you're talking about, if I'm hearing you right, it's really integrating this in your whole life. So it's just something that maybe it doesn't come, um, uh, maybe it doesn't, even, what I'm trying to say, maybe it's not something that, that just becomes unconscious. Maybe it is a, an intentional stepping forward every day, integrating this practice in your life. Like any of us that, that are starting to work out again, I'm, I'm trying to work out again. I have to include it as a practice in my day so that it just becomes a natural part of my day. It doesn't mean that I do it without thinking, but I think it will become easier and easier over time. Is that kind of what you're saying about uh, building a ritual into your life, about really embodying a new way of of managing everything else that we have to do in our world? Yeah, absolutely. And it's really that level of awareness and that consciousness that is the differentiator between a habit versus a ritual. Because we can have certain habits every day that promote mm. our health and wellness, but if we're not doing them consciously or intentionally, then quite often they don't become sustainable. They don't fully integrate into our lifestyle. And so we often associate what a habit is with like a checklist or a specific outcome or a specific um, course or destination. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. What I'm asking readers to, to discern and to explore for themselves is that what would be possible if instead of thinking about checking off a list or thinking about the destination, what if you fully embodied and immersed yourself in the process? And what would that look like? So, you know, a lot of the um, embodiment practices that I've employed for myself over the last few years are solely focused on attuning to what my body is communicating to me in any given moment. And, you know, just like you said, you know, Using exercise, that's a great example because so many of us aspire for greater health and well being. Um, some of us aspire to reach a certain goal with whether it be weight loss or, or muscle gain or strength or anything like that. Um, but when we're thinking about the process in terms of what a habit is and how we would execute on a habit, it feels for most people, it feels like a checklist. It's like, if I just do this, 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 and this, then I'll get to this. And, and that is a very linear and a very um, straightforward process. It's almost like a formula. If you get, if you complete all of the checks, then you get this result. And then, you know, that's when good things happen, right? Whereas embodiment is a practice. It's a non-linear practice. And a non-linear means that as we are going through the process, we're not necessarily making a list and checking things off. What we are doing is we are pausing more, we are reflecting more, we are feeling more about what we are experiencing in the moment, differentiating between what feels good and what doesn't feel so great, and using those feelings as a guide to move on to the next step. So you might still have a checklist if you are using embodiment to reach a specific goal or, or objective, but the difference is that instead of, a, instead of going through that checklist in a chronological order, you might be starting at number one and then bouncing to number five and then bouncing to number three and then to number 10. You know, you are 
allowing yourself and giving permission and creating space for you to progress in a way that feels natural and flows with ease. Sorry, what I love about that is when we talk about decision making practices for event planners, how there is um, more than one way to get things done. So when we are trained or we it's worked in the past, like you say, it's worked in the past to check the list from one to ten or to go through your milestone document and you're going from one milestone to the next. If we are trusting ourselves and trusting what we have, you know, in time embodied, and we have been practicing listening to where we should be making that phone call or, or checking off that one part of the list. I think the flow, my theme for this year was flow. And I think when I, when I think about what you're saying and how I could adopt that in my own world and as my, you know, in my own practice as an event planner, there's this um, the ease to it. There can be a, a flow to it and where things will all get done. It doesn't mean that we're not looking at working with excellence and getting the job done. But if we can choose to do it in a way where it aligns better with who we are, with who we love to have in our lives, with the people we love to work with, the types of people that we want to partner with. I think this idea of making uh, decision making um, not just easier, but I think more direct. So, so we're getting better results with each of those decisions. I, I have heard over and over again in the last probably six months, um, a lot of planners are dealing with overwhelm. They're dealing with too many decisions, too many new things that they have to learn quickly. And if we can start looking at, that's why I'm so thrilled that you're going to be writing this article for, for moments coming up, because I think when we start thinking about um, coming back to what one little piece that you wrote in um, in your draft here, but this is um, the fact that there is a way to bring flow and ease to all the metrics, systems, deadlines, outcomes, and destinations that we work towards every day. And that that's that paradigm shift that we're actually starting to, like you say, embody a new ritual, a new way of getting to the end result, which is really beautiful. And I, I think um, once you start to embrace that, and I felt that for myself in the past, when I've started to embrace that type of practice and, and putting this as part of my lifestyle, then it becomes kind of fun because you're starting to see things that, um, wow, that happened really easily, or, oh, I can't believe that entered here where that actually takes me where I need to go here. And, and you start to see the flow in a very different way. And so what a gift that you are giving us. And uh, we're not going to go into the three tips because I, I want people to be able to read those in the magazine. Um, but anything else you'd like to leave with us, an encouragement to those that are watching today um, on how maybe something they could take away today that they could be doing um, to start integrating this into their planning right away. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one thing that I, a very common theme with a lot of the clients that I work with is how do I execute on the tasks and the checklists that I have every single day from a more heart-centered heart space? And what it really you know, for a lot of individuals boils down to is identifying their purpose and weaving and integrating that into the work that they do every day. Mm -hmm. And so if you are in a situation where a lot of what you do feels heavy, it kind of creates resistance in the body, kind of makes you feel icky or tense, then that is already a very strong indicator that you may not be aligned with your purpose and what you're doing. And it's not to say that you can't shift the paradigm and, and improve that situation for yourself and still continue to, to do the work that you're doing. Um, you don't need to pivot out of the industry. You don't need to stop doing what you're, what you're doing for your career. But having that awareness of how you feel in the moment, tuning into your heart, connecting with your mind, and learning what courses of action feel best for you what situations, what approaches bring out the best in you and allow you to flourish instead of feeling bogged down and heavy. Those are very simple things that can 
completely transform the way that you do your work. And embodiment is, like I said, a practice. It's not a destination. It's not something that you all of a sudden wake up to and things are better. You have to be committed to the process because at the end of the day, embodiment practice is the same, very similar to self-care. So we all have careers and we have livelihoods, we have obligations, bills to pay, people to take care of, but we can be more holistic and authentic in how we do that. And we can actually influence how impactful the work that we do is for other people by taking care of ourselves first and affirming within ourselves how to do our work so that we can show up the strongest and in the most authentic way. And, and if I could just add, because the theme of, of this issue is climb. And so we're, I'm, I'm having some great conversations from real, with real climbers, with people that are on the ice or on the rock. And, and what you're saying about um, continuing on with the practice and committing yourself to the practice is exactly what they're saying too. Once you've committed to the climb, you are you're finding the hold, you're, you're, you're not going back. You're, you're really trying to move forward in the best way possible, very intentionally moving forward up, uh, you know, if it's a rock face or an ice face. Um, and and I, I love what you're saying because so many times I think we get um, so involved in the urgency and this, you know, what we think in the moment is the most important thing and we get really caught up in that. And the more we, create a practice like what you're talking about the more committed we are to the climb the more at ease and focused we are on the climb and the more we can enjoy the view and I think having the um, having the opportunity to talk to planners in this issue about what really matters and I know that's part of everything you do Michelle <laughs> is that you want to get to the heart of things and everything that you do in your coaching and your training for not just women leaders, but leaders that really want to embody something more in their leadership, you're giving them that opportunity to lean in and let this become a more impactful work, you know, process that they're, they're actually building. So thank you so much for being here. I'm so thrilled that you'll be writing this article for the magazine. And I do want to encourage anyone I here behind me, I actually found this on my board from a couple of months ago. But uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I ever posted this, but it says, hey, planner, who are you? How are you climbing? And what is your view? So this is something that as we post these in the next couple of weeks, as we're leading up to the November 10th virtual launch, um, share with us, like, how are you climbing? If you've taken something from what Michelle has said today, I would love to hear from you because it's so important for us to understand this for ourselves. I have been planning and promoting events for over 30 years and I'm still learning from people like Michelle on how to do this um, with ease, how to do this in a way that I feel fed, but also where I'm becoming more effective to the community that I wanna serve. So we wanna hear from you too. Um, watch our social streams for all of the links that you need to join us for free on November the 10th. Michelle will be in the issue. We're gonna be interviewing some other contributors coming up. And you can find the link uh, to come to the party is at candyconsulting.ca slash moments dash magazine. And you can join us for that. Thank you again, Michelle. What a, what a pleasure to talk to you about this. And I'm really excited to learn those or share those top three tips that you've got for people on how to actually move from this autopilot habit space to where they're really embodying these powerful rituals and, and what does that actually look like for them to be climbing and, and committing to that lifestyle. It's, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everybody. And I just wanna let everyone know that um, like Lisa said, I'm connect with me on LinkedIn, connect with me through social media. I'd love to hear your story and, um, and be able to support you on that journey. Fantastic. And we'll put your links in the comments below as well. Thanks so much, everybody, and we will see you on the next conversations with our contributors.